We're going to begin our second talk. This is the first part of a two-part talk on the Cartesian-Darwinian narrative. I mentioned this briefly at the start of the talk on human evolution, but we're going to spend some time in this um, presentation and tomorrow's as well going into a more detailed history of what the narrative really is all about. And this is basically the the information here is taken from our newest book, The Fall of Darwin's Last Icon and the Failure of the Cartesian-Darwinian Narrative. So when we talk about what the narrative really is, it's, it's a false view of reality, what we call in the book a grand deception that has impacted virtually every domain of thought and even beyond of official domains, pop culture, the media, and so forth, were constantly surrounded by the narrative. The narrative is, at its core, irreconcilable with Christianity, although it has infected even many so-called Christian intellectuals. The narrative has a long history, but it can basically be summarized in a single sentence, and the sentence is as follows. If there is a God... He does not intervene in the affairs of men. No miracles are allowed in the Cartesian-Darwinian world. If there is a God, so this allows for the possibility that there is not a God, he does not intervene in the affairs of men, so this would be very compatible with uh, somebody that claims to be an agnostic or a deist who believes in some kind of a supernatural force but doesn't believe in the God of Christianity and no miracles are allowed in the Cartesian-Darwinian world. So we'll start to unpack that and show how the narrative came about. Well, having ancient roots that extend back to Greece uh, before Christ was born, the narrative was formally introduced into the world in the year 1637 by somebody I refer to in the book as a masked man, he introduced this under mysterious circumstances that will be explained shortly. But this masked man referred to himself in that manner, and so I borrowed the term from his own writings. The coming of the narrative in the end times was foretold in sacred scripture. The masked man who introduced the narrative in 1637 stated that his purpose was to combat the reemergence of false ancient Greek philosophies but his work turned out to be a great aid to these false philosophies and others to come. The narrative has been destructive almost beyond imagination. Through the talk today and then the second talk tomorrow, we will try to get through all of these domains of thought that in, in uh, the secular world, in education, in colleges especially, are reflected in subject matters that you see here on the list, as well as pop culture, government policy, international relations. Virtually every area of thought has been impacted by the narrative. So let's start now at the very beginning. We're going to go back to ancient Greece and talk about developments in the area of philosophy that reemerged in uh, the 16th century and then reemerged at the start of the 20th century in a sort of mega philosophy that now dominates the world. But there are three groups of philosophers that we want to introduce uh, dating to ancient Greeks. The first group, they were called the skeptics. They brought a systematic doubt to philosophical questions, and they mastered the art of arguing that uh, any statement could be either true or false, and they would they would put on demonstrations and conclude that there really is no such thing as, as truth. And the only way to reach a tranquil life and not have internal uh, uh, problems or just uh, disturbances is to suspend judgment on philosophical questions. And here we're talking mainly meta metaphysical questions such as the existence of a first, uh, uh, first cause, 
the existence of an afterlife and the existence of the soul. So those skeptics said, well, we don't really know. You can argue it either way. Let's just suspend judgment. Second group uh, is led by uh, Aristotle. He was a philosophical realist. In other words, he believed that we can trust, trust our senses to gain authentic knowledge about the world. He thought that the content life involves the pursuit of truth. He developed metaphysics as a phys- philosophical subject, answering key questions that also touch on the area of theology. And then there was the philosophy of materialism. This was introduced to the ancient Greeks by a number of philosophers. The most important for our purposes was named Epicurus, who died about three centuries before Jesus was born. The basic thrust of materialism says that all that exists is matter and that the universe is either eternal or very, very ancient, and that it was the random combination of atoms that account for everything. And so there's no need to pull a creator into this whole explanation of how everything came about, came about. (laughs) The goal of life, according to Epicurus, was to seek pleasure and avoid pain, for that fits today's uh, culture quite well, doesn't it? That view is often called hedonism today. Materialism did not end with Epicurus. It was transferred over to Roman uh, Roman society, most notably by a philosopher named Lucretius, who died uh, just before Jesus was born. What is notable about Lucretius is that he advanced the biological aspect of materialist philosophy. In his work on the nature of things, he clearly anticipates the concept of natural selection that would be introduced to Europe uh, formally in 1859 in The Origin of Species. But he described the process of natural selection and survival of the fittest as follows. He wrote that many races of living things must then have died out and been unable to beget and continue their breed. For in the case of all things which you see breathing, either craft or courage or else speed, has from the beginning of its existence protected and preserved each particular race. But those to whom nature has granted none of these qualities would lie exposed as a prey until nature brought that kind to utter destruction. So the fittest survive, those that do not perish. Well, when Christianity... Uh, emerged after um, after the foundation of, of the church, and um, as Christianity became legal in the Roman Empire, there was a powerful uh, counterpart and confrontation to materialist philosophy. In uh, the the uh, Acts of the Apostles, chapter seventeen, we read about Paul, the Apostle Paul, engaging materialists, the Epicureans, in Athens. And so we know that his action was followed by uh, writings of many church fathers against the materialists. One very good uh, writing against the materialists is by Lactantius, a a Latin father, who died in 323. And in in his book, or the writings on the workmanship of God or the formation of man, he states, I cannot be prevented from again showing the folly of Epicurus. For all the ravings of Lucretius belong to him, who in order that he might show that animals are not produced by any contrivance of the divine mind, but by chance, said that in the beginning of the world, innumerable other animals of wonderful form and magnitude were produced, but that they were unable to be permanent because either the power of taking food or the method of uniting and generating had failed them. It is evident that he wished to exclude the divine providence by setting forth this explanation. So the question emerges, if they had the basics, the the, the fundamentals of Darwin's theory worked out in the the early centuries in the Roman Empire, and the church fathers clearly recognized this explanation of the world and reality as a a philosophical maneuver to uh, to deny the creator, why don't we in present times have the same attitude? Very few people recognize Darwinism as simply a philosophical maneuver. Um, 
And of course, the, the explanation given by many people is the claim that, well, in the years after Darwin, um, good proofs of evolution have arisen. Of course, we've seen uh, in previous presentations this week that that's a misunderstanding of where the evidence really leads. Well, we're going to fast forward here uh, for the next 10 centuries. In Christian Europe, materialism was largely presented from having a strong influence on the Western world as Christianity spread. When we get up to the Middle Ages, we enter the period of high, the, of high scholasticism. Uh, this period is, is, uh, includes the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas and was really a, a remarkable achievement. One of the fundamental beliefs or teachings of Thomism is the notion that truth cannot contradict truth. You'll hear that expressed today by many Catholic theologians, meaning that the truth in all domains, science, theology, philosophy, is in harmony and supports the Christian worldview. This gave rise to search for knowledge in all domains and to advancements in all fields, including science, during that period. Theology was recognized as the queen of the sciences, as some things could only be revealed by God. However, each area of study was recognized to properly have its own method of study. Thomas, or Thomism built upon Aristotle's philosophical system and showed it to be largely in harmony with Christian thought. Well, the period of high scholasticism did not last long after the death of St. Thomas Aquinas. And as, as, as we move into the Renaissance in the 15th and 16th centuries, we see a revival of classic Greek scholarship emerge in Europe due to new and better translations and the emergence of the printing press. And so uh, reprints of the writings of Lucretius and Epicurus begin to circulate around Europe. And in fact, by 1600, ancient Greek philosophies and arguments were being increasingly set forth to battle for the minds of Christian Europe. Skeptic and materialist arguments led the way. So these ancient Greek uh, arguments, philosophies, reemerged in a vengeance starting in the 1400s. And by the uh, 1600, there was a crisis emerging among the intellectuals in Europe. So broad skepticism resulted from this. In his book, At the Origins of Modern Atheism, Michael Buckley uh, just summarizes this period by stating that at the opening of the 17th century, there was a widespread conviction that the atheists were at the gates. One example was a French philosopher, Michael de Montaigne. He was, uh, he's classified as a skeptic, and he wrote in his Apology for Raymond Sabon this skeptical attitude. He wrote, or he asked the question, has that quest for truth, which has kept man busy for so many centuries, actually enriched him with some new power or solid truth? He then goes on to compare widely varying opinions among philosophers uh, concerning topics such as the existence of the soul. He concludes, there is a plague on man, his opinion that he knows something. Man indeed is out of his mind. He cannot even create a flesh worm, yet he creates gods by the dozen. He summarized and concluded by saying skepticism can be conceived through the form of a question, what do I know? And with that question, the stage was set for the masked man. All it would take for the masked man to emerge would be an inadequate response to the new skeptics. And this, in fact, did occur. In uh, Michael Buckley's book, he calls what happened, he refers to it as the self-alienation of Christianity. And basically what happened was, rather than combat the the new skeptics and atheists with arguments from all areas of thought, science, theology, philosophy, the theologians of the time basically went back to ancient Greeks and they made arguments that were, were almost totally philosophical in nature and did not reflect the knowledge and learning that had been gained since the time of the ancient Greeks. Buckley explains the response this way. He said that the uh, theologians of the day treated the atheistic question as if it were a philosophical issue, not a religious one. 
as if the rising movement were not a rejection of Jesus Christ as the supreme presence of God in human history, as if religious experience or Christianity possesses nothing with which to engage this issue of the existence of God. The theologian as such is to say that he has nothing to say. The warrant for the personal God was the impersonal world. The strongest evidence for the personal God was the design within nature. So we're, we're ignoring 16 centuries of Christian teaching, uh, of the reality of the incarnation, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was the, re was the way most theologians responded. And by, by limiting these arguments to the single domain of philosophy, and in fact going back to the arguments set forth by the ancient Greeks, the ground rules were being set for the massive debates that soon emerged during the Enlightenment. Blaise Pascal, a French philosopher and mathematician who knew the masked man, he clearly was one of the few that understood the limits of the approach. He wrote the following. He wrote that Jesus Christ is the object of all things, the center towards which all things tend. Whoever knows him knows the reason for everything. All of those who seek God apart from Christ and who go no further than nature either find no light to satisfy them or come to devise a means of knowing and serving God without a mediator, thus falling uh, into either atheism or deism. So that was the trap that many of the Christian theologians fell into around 1600. And so as the new skeptics made inroads, it was not clear what response against the skeptics and the atheists or the materialists would be effective. And that's what set the stage for the emergence of the masked man. So let's introduce him now. The masked man was born in 1596 in France. He died in 1650. His name was René Descartes, which you probably uh, know that name uh, well, uh, pronounced or spelled Cartesius in Latin. So when we talk about the Cartesian Darwinian narrative, we're talking about a narrative beginning with Descartes that extends, it's a continuous uh, line of thought that concludes with Darwin. He was educated by Jesuits and then obtained a law degree in 1616. He was very highly intelligent and a genius in mathematics. After he attained his law degree, he volunteered as a soldier and spent time in Holland. And then in 1619, he spent the, uh, his winter quarters were in Germany. And that's where the key events took place that we're going to discuss now. By the spring of 1619, he became convinced that he had a great personal destiny, one that would introduce a new method of discovering knowledge and ending skepticism. He wrote in March of 1619, To conceal nothing, I propose to give the public an entirely new science which will allow of a general solution to all problems which can be proposed. How incredibly ambitious, he wrote to a friend. He also wrote that the sciences are now masked from us. The mask removed, they will appear in all their beauty, and must not he himself go, un go masked until such time as he might find himself able in fulfillment of his mission to come forward publicly on its behalf. So he had this sense of a personal destiny to, to introduce new knowledge and a way of thinking to the world. Now, mo the, the best information on Descartes is from uh, a French biographer, Adrien uh, Bayer, who wrote The Life of Mr. Uh, Descartes in 1691. It was published as a large two-volume set. There's a that, that I don't believe is available in English. There's a condensed single-volume set that is available in English. But according to uh, Bayer, little progress was made by Descartes into the fall of 1619 to introduce this this new way of thinking to the world, and this led to a period of great agitation on the part of Descartes. As he settled into winter quarters near Ulm, Germany, he met some men of science, and he discovered that there was a fraternity of learned men under the name of the Brethren of Rosy Cross. They were some sort of they were the sort of men which understood everything and promised to help men to a new wisdom. That is to say, a new science not hitherto discovered. Descartes found himself so much the more intrigued 
because he received the news at the very time when it, he was the most busy concerning the mediums for finding out of truth. So here Descartes is uh, in the fall of 1619, frustrated that he's not making progress on his new uh, method of learning, and he learns of men, brethren of the Rosy Cross. These are the Rosicrucians, the occult society. And so he uh, makes an effort to meet these uh, Rosicrucians. Uh, they became known in Europe and Germany through two tracts that uh, were released in 1614 and 1615. And you can see the appeal of um, the Rosicrucian way of thought to Descartes. They match his quest almost exactly. For example, in the Confessio, the Rosicrucians write, No other philosophy we have than that which is the head and sum, the foundation and contents of all faculties, sciences, and arts. All learned who will make themselves known unto us and come into our brotherhood shall find more wonderful secrets by us than heretofore they are able to uh, they are able to believe or utter. So again, it was exactly what the young Descartes was uh, looking for in order to further his quest to introduce this new way of, uh, of reasoning. Now, Bailly claims that he was not successful. Descartes was not successful in making contact. But there are many ind indications, even in the, the biography that he wrote, that Bailly wrote, that Descartes did, in fact, make contact with the Rosicrucians. According to uh, Bailly, the pivotal date of November 10th, 1619, uh, was key because on that day, Descartes was so he so fatigued himself that his brain became inflamed and he fell into a sort of enthusiasm in a state to receive impressions of dreams and visions. That evening before he retired, a man Descartes referred to as the genius told Descartes that he would receive dreams that night to provide guidance in this quest that Descartes had self-appointed himself. Descartes received three dreams which he believed were from on high, but in truth, they were likely of demonic origin. Descartes, Descartes describes that a spirit caused great fear that descended on him to take possession of him, among other indicators that this dream was not from the spirit of truth, as Descartes claimed. Descartes believed he was being asked to decide the kind of life to be chosen, and he was so bold as to feel that the dream was giving him the opportunity to open before him the treasures of all the sciences during the remainder of his life. So this was the breakthrough that De Descartes thought came from heaven, but did not. The dreams would guide Descartes until his death in 1650. He considered them the most important event of his life. Now, after 1619, Descartes kind of disappears from the scene. He travels Europe uh, and doesn't reemerge in France until 1622. For six years, he lived in France in a very worldly uh, way, but in 1628, another turning point occurred in the story of the narrative. In November of 1628, Descartes was invited to hear a lecture regarding a new philosophy said to be able to refute the rise of skepticism and atheism in Europe. Cardinal de Berulle noticed that after the lecture, Descartes was the only one not impressed by the lecturer, and Descartes explained that any philosophy relying on clever arguments and mere probability can result in the false being accepted as true and vice versa. This, this has some uh, rings of the skeptics kind of view of, of arguments. Descartes was asked by the cardinal if there was any method that could avoid such problems. Descartes explained that he had developed a method from the treasury of the mathematical sciences capable of demonstrating all truth. Encouraged by the discussion, Descartes believed it was time to take off his mask and present the world with his method, but to do so, he relocated from France to Holland and began several years of work. As he began, he immediately rejected scholasticism and traditional metaphysics, writing that his scholastic training had no effect other than the increase, increasing discovery of my own ignorance. Descartes began by asking Montaigne's question, the French philosopher, what do I know? What do I know for sure? He was an idealist, Descartes was, and believed that we cannot trust our senses. And so the only thing he knew was that he existed because he was a thinking being. 
Hence the famous statement that we've all heard, I think, therefore I am. He concluded his existence cannot be doubted, and he called this or described this as a clear and distinct idea that was really in, incapable of doubt and independent of the senses. He reasoned that if all questions in all domains can be reduced to clear and distinct ideas, all doubt would be eliminated. This approach became what he called universal mathematics, through which we reject all such merely probable knowledge and make it a rule to trust only what is completely known and incapable of being doubted. The clear and distinct ideas uh, were the aim of in, in all areas. This new philosophy became, came to be known as rationalism. Rationalism, assert, rationalism asserts that because everything must be reduced to clear and distinct ideas that are already present in the human mind, there cannot be anything which exceeds the power of human reason to comprehend. It's a very important definition. There cannot be anything which exceeds the power of the human reason to comprehend. So just think about if that's your governing view of knowledge in all area, what does that mean when we start to introduce that concept into the area of theology? What does it mean about the origin of the world or the universe? What does it mean about the incarnation the resurrection of Christ. Very quickly, we can see that because the Bible is filled with miracles and prophecies that the human mind can't fully understand, we can see very quickly that rationalism would lead to a denial of the miraculous and the sacred uh, and prophecies in the sacred scriptures. So this resulted not just in the separation of faith and reason, but the elevation of reason above revelation. Descartes himself wrote, I have faith in the teachings of the church, but I simply bracket all that out. It is in the realm of religious sentiment and emotion, whereas my universal science is in the realm of reason and knowledge. And Descartes himself was fairly cautious about applying rationalism directly to the scriptures that would come right after his death by other, other uh, philosophers. But he, he did write a number of items that that make you understand he did intend to apply that to theology. In Meditations on First Philosophy, he wrote that even the concepts of God and the soul should be demonstrated by philosophical rather than theological argument. He also wrote that all that which can be known of God may be made manifest by means which are not derived from anywhere but from ourselves and from the simple consideration of our minds. Given Descartes' intent to apply his new method to all domains of thought, he could have chosen any field to demonstrate his method in his first manuscript. What do you think he chose as the subject area of his first manuscript? He chose the subject of origins in the beginning. He started at the beginning, and we know at the beginning was a supernatural event, creation, and so Darwin or Descartes targeted origins with his initial writings. That was his very first uh, topic. So he began his work in 1628 on a, on a book uh, called The World, Le Monde in French. And he was ready for publication in the, by the year 1633. However, within weeks of the publication, something made him decide not to publish. He pulled it from the publisher. And the event was the Galileo, what, what is called the Galileo Affair. Descartes knew that Le Monde was much more radical than anything Galileo had to say, and that it would likely be condemned by the church. So he's very fearful of publishing it, and he pulled it from the printer just weeks before it was to go to print. Well, let's ask ourselves, what is it in Le Monde that was so radical that Descartes, after having spent almost five years on this, pulled it from the printer? The answer is that Le Monde was a direct attack on the creation providence framework, and it involved the reassignment of origins from historical theology to natural science. It was meant to be the start of the narrative. So as we you start to read through the world, and by the way, Le Monde was never published in Descartes' lifetime, but it came it came available after he died. So we can now go look at Le Monde and see why it was so radical. In Le Monde, he invites the reader to enter into a wholly new world, a make-believe world. But he said, let us not try to go all the way 
but rather enter it only far enough to lose sight of all the creatures that God has made. Let us suppose that God creates only matter and continues, uh, the matter continues moving thereafter in accordance with the ordinary laws of nature. And even if God creates nothing more than this, than raw matter, the laws of nature are sufficient to cause the parts of this chaos to disentangle and in the form of a most perfect world containing all that appears in the actual world. Then he clarifies, he says, by nature, I do not mean some deity or other sort of imaginary power whether I use the word to signify matter itself. Think about how, how closely this mirrors the beliefs of the materialists, the ancient Greek philosophers that were atheists. He said, matter alone can organize the chaos. The knowledge of these laws is so natural to our soul that we cannot but judge them infallible. These are clear and distinct ideas in his mind. When we conceive them distinctly, and they can produce everything that can be be produced in this new world. He concludes, and so that there will be nothing to prevent this, we shall, if you please, assume God will never perform a miracle in the new world. God is allowed to create the initial chaotic matter. After that, natural laws take over and account for everything. Fast forward to the 20th century. We have supposed scientific demonstration, the origin of the universe, the origin of all life forms, the uh, explanation for the geological columns. All of it is said to occur by natural processes. So this has very ancient roots extending back to Le Monde that was actually not published. And that's a very interesting uh, story that we'll get into uh, next here. But in Le Mans, he goes on to discuss the formation of the sun, the stars, the planets, the Earth's geological features, plants and animals, and even explains that man is merely a machine, but he demonstrates nothing scientifically. Um, and he kind of excuses himself from putting forth real scientific uh, uh, explanations by saying that I do not promise to set out exact demonstrations of everything I say. It will be enough for me to open up the way for you to find them yourselves when you take the trouble to look for them. So he was basically setting forth the game plan, if you will, of naturalistic science to enter and explain things that were previously attributed to historical theology, to supernatural creation and other events that natural science cannot uh, fully explain. Le Mans is one of, one of the very first what we would call just so stories uh, that we see all the time by scientists, all the false claims in the biology textbooks. But it should also be understood as laying out a blueprint for future like-minded scientists who wanted to reallocate origins away from historical theology to philosophy and science. After he set forth this blueprint he, blueprint, he later wrote, I know that several centuries may go by before all the truths it is possible to deduce from these principles have been deduced. So that ended up being the role of Lyell in 1830 and Darwin in 1859 to, to complete this game plan. And then finally, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, the Big Bang comes and takes care of the naturalistic explanation in cosmology. All right, so let's talk about um, how the narrative actually came into fruition uh, to public knowledge if Descartes decided not to publish Le Mans after 1633. Well, after Le Mans was not published, Descartes sought to in introduce his method to the world through a more subtle approach. This attack occurred in part five of the Discourse on Method, which marks the formal public beginning of the Cartesian-Darwinian narrative. In the Discourse on Method, Descartes claims to have demonstrated in Le Mans. So this is part five. He's already gone through by this time in Discourse on Method. He's explained the whole concept of the uh, distinct and clear ideas, how that all came about by doubting everything. And now he wants to demonstrate that applying his method can, re can produce real resu results. So because Le Mans was not published, he explains in part five of Discourse on Method what he demonstrated in the area of science using his method. So he claims to have demonstrated in Le Mans how the greatest part of the matter must, in accordance with these laws of nature, 
disposed and arranged itself similar to our heavens, and how some of its parts must form an earth, some planets and comets, and some others a sun and, and fixed stars, and made it clear that there is nothing to be seen in our system which must not appear exactly the same. I also showed in Le Mans how the mountains, seas, fountains, and rivers could naturally be formed, how the metals came to be, and generally how all bodies might arise. So again, this is uh, again setting forth the future program for naturalism in cosmology and geology. He also uh, moved then, after this general discussion, to directly attack the creation providence framework through three consecutive sentences that we'll, we'll show on the next slide. This basically was the introduction of the concept of gradualism or uniformitarianism uh, into Europe um, through, through his work. And again, that would be completed by Lyell in, in terms of application to geology and Darwin in terms of uh, life and origins. All right, so the three sentences that are really the key part of this whole discussion. Descartes explained that in Le Mans, that was not published, I did not wish to infer that this world was created in the manner which I described, for it is much more probable that at the beginning God made it as it was to be. What he's doing here is trying to set at ease those theologians who would be looking to condemn Descartes for his radical uh, uh, attack on the creation providence framework. So he makes this, this kind of, uh, uh, don't worry about it, and then he goes into the following two sentences. He says, but it is certain, and it is an opinion held by the theo theologians, no it's not, that the action by which he now preserves it, the world, is just the same as that which, by, by which at first he created it. He said, in this way, giving no form uh, of matter other than that of chaos, we may well believe, without doing outrage to the miracle of creation, that by this means alone, all things which are purely material might in course of time have become such as we observe them to be at the present. And their nature is much easier to understand when we see them coming to pass little by little in this manner than were we to consider them all uh, complete to begin with. So Descartes recognizes that natural processes are going to need millions and millions, if not billions of years, to bring about all that he says it brought about. The, the universe, the solar system, the plants, geological features, and, and life itself. So um, th this is describing a period of uni or a process of uniformitarianism or gradualism that occurs through natural laws that take millions upon millions of years to uh, result in what we now see in the world, according to Descartes. All right, he also sets forth there the plan for pale paleoanthropology, the study of human evolution that we just talked about. His, his wording is interesting. He says that since I had not yet sufficient knowledge to speak of man in the same style as the rest, that is showing from what beginning and in what fashion nature must produce them, I contented myself with supposing that God formed the body of man without first placing in it a rational soul. So he, he, he kind of hints that, well, now I do have, there is information out there that would allow me to make that argument, but he's kind of cautious because he knows he's going to get in trouble with the, uh, the theologians if he pushes that issue too far. Again, uh, Blaise Pascal, uh, who knew Descartes, um, understood the game plan, the strategy that was being invoked. He wrote, I cannot forgive Descartes in his whole philosophy. He would like to do without God but he could not help allowing him to allowing him a flick of the fingers to set the world in, no, in motion. After that, he had no more use for God. And you see that attitude of Descartes reflected in many of today's scientists. Richard Dickerson wrote in 1992 that science is fundamentally a game. Let us see how far and to what extent we can explain the physical and material universe in terms of purely physical and material causes without invoking the supernatural. Discourse on, uh, discourse on method, you may have uh, heard this uh, talked about earlier in the week, but this, this really is uh, marks the fulfillment of 2 Peter uh, 3, 3 through 7, that says, Know this first of all, that in the last days scoffers will come, living according to their own desires, and saying everything has remained as it was from the beginning of creation. 
They deliberately ignore, they're not looking at the real evidence, they deliberately ignore the fact that the heavens existed of old and earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, not natural processes, by the word of God. Well, in the in the uh, the book, The Fall of Darwin's Last Icon and the Failure of the, the Narrative, I go and discuss some of the problems with the uh, philosophy itself that Descartes put forth. And today, you don't you don't see Cartesian philosophers. I mean, well, they'll they'll study Descartes and teach about Descartes in terms of his historical significance, but nobody really holds as true what Descartes put forth. So why is he revered so much in uh, secular uh, the secular university setting and secular philosophy? Well, he really has uh, a lasting legacy legacy that consists of at least four things. One is that he accounted for, began the separation of faith and reason. He rejected scholasticism, which afforded each domain its own method, but recognized theology as the queen of the sciences. Um, he initiated the improper reassignment of origins from historical theology to natural science, and he initiated the view that if God exists, he does not intervene in the affairs of men. No miracles are allowed in the Cartesian world. Pope John Paul, Pope St. John Paul II, has talked about the influence of rationalists during this period of time. In the encyclical Faith and Reason, he wrote that as a result of the exaggerated rationalism of certain thinkers, there emerged eventually a philosophy which was separate from and absolutely independent of the contents of faith. What for patristic and medieval thought was in both theory and practice a profound unity was destroyed. Descartes died in 1650. By that time, he died at, died at a young age, but by that time, rationalism had already infected many universities and intellectuals across Europe. After Descartes, theologians had less and less to say in the discussion among Europe's intellectuals about the existence of God, the afterlife, and uh, immortality and morality. The boundaries for the debates of the Enlightenment had already been established by the time Descartes died. It would be a philosophical battle going back to the arguments put forth by the ancient Greeks. So the ending position, the ending position of Cartesian rationalism resembled ancient materialism and skepticism in many ways. Uh, and we'll see in tomorrow's talk that by the start of the 20th century, these uh, three philosophies would merge into a mega philosophy that would quickly rise to dominate the Western world. All right, so wrapping up the discussion of Descartes, um, there are two perspectives that are worthy to consider. One is a, uh, a summary by uh, Etienne Gilson. He wrote that Descartes' philosophy was nothing else than a recklessly conducted experiment to see what becomes of human knowledge when molded into conformity with a pattern of mathematical evidence. We would waste our time in asking Descartes for a rational justification. So Gilson just says, well, Descartes was just re a young, reckless philosopher and came up with these notions. He, Gilson does not acknowledge the influence of, uh, probable influence of, um, of the demonic and the Rosicrucians in taking Descartes astray. Another perspective, though, um, is written by uh, Jacques Maritain, who concludes in a very good book, this was, I think, written in the 1930s or 40s, I think 30s, called The Dreams of Descartes. He concludes, what was it that gave Descartes the strength to break with an age-long tradition? What was the spiritual germ, the central intuition, which contained all the energies of the Cartesian Revolution? The notes made by the philosopher in his youth enabled us to answer that question with a, degree, a certain degree of probability. It is very embarrassing for modern rationalism to have been born in a dream, and at that, one in which a genius who had for several days past been exciting enthusiasm in him predicted to the philosopher before he had retired to his bed. However, that is the fact. So he's acknowledging the, the possibility, if not probability, that um, demonic influences played a role in the emergence of Cartesian philosophy. All right, so we've seen that by the time of Descartes' death, really between 1637 and 1650, Descartes himself introduced uh, rationalistic philosophy 
into areas impacting a number of domains. And in our next talk, we'll pick it up from there and we'll talk about during the period from 1651 to 1830, we'll see the expansion of the influence of rationalism and Cartesian philosophy into the areas of political philosophy, ethics, and history. Then we'll talk about, by 1900, the domains of jurisprudence, that's legal philosophy, uh, clinical psychology, sociology were added as far as being dominated by Cartesian thought. And then in the 20th century, we have educational philosophy, experimental psychology, international relations, government policy, pop culture. In other words, it's, it's hard to find any area of society that is not influenced and, in fact, dominated by the narrative. Remember at the start of my talk in Human Evolution that uh, concluding those concluding paragraphs I read before I went into the fossil evidence, that was in a chapter talking about the inevitable outcomes of what happens when educational philosophy becomes captive to false Cartesian, Cartesian rationalism, um, but actually in today's terminology it really is more of this mega philosophy that I was talking about, and it's called humanism which has dominated the public schools in this country since 1900. Okay, with that, we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up, and uh, we'll go on to the next top talk. Thank you very much.